Well, we are in our, our second week of, of Advent, and uh, this is kind of new for you. If you're like me, I wasn't, I wasn't raised in, in, in this, um, these kind of um, systems and that sort of thing and traditions. And so I am really, as I'm, as I'm growing um, into be, hopefully becoming a better pastor and, and leader and that sort of thing, I, I'm, really, I'm really excited that we're, we're getting to know Advent and, and celebrating that a little bit better. Because here, here's why, uh, not just for the symbolism and getting people involved and, and that sort of thing, but I, I love the idea of, of, of re- being reminded of, of some of the bed, bedrock beliefs and, and core beliefs and words that, that should come to mind in everyday life. And that's what Advent reminds us of, is that we are, we are recognizing the birth of the Messiah, that he came, the miraculous birth, um, as we talked about last week, it, it's, it's filled with hope, the story is, because it didn't make sense. I mean, it had to be God to come through an ordinary, common family like that. And so these words like hope and love, joy, and today as we talk about, a big one is peace. And I'll just be, be real with you, at least so far, this is, this is probably one of my favorites, because um, as I get to know you and your lives as I face my everyday life and, and all that kind of goes through that, um, there, is a, there is a constant need to slow down. There is a constant need. And here's our prayer many times. We want God to put everything and everyone at rest, right? We want him to, to just stop and bring peace to the chaos. But the reality is that never really happens. Anybody ever had that chaos? It's, it's, it's all about us, right? It's all about us. It, it's our issue. And so, so that's why I find it interesting that the shepherds, when they, when they appeared to, or the, the angels appeared to the shepherds uh, in the field, one of the messages in there is, we're going to read it, Luke chapter 2, verse 14. It's an amazing declaration here. He says, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So the angels comes along and says, I'm going to declare something. Now, there's a big, huge message, right? And they're singing, and they're, there's an amazing thing that's going on. You can kind of imagine the shepherds, why they were afraid. You and I would be afraid, too. Okay, let's, let's just be real with ourselves. You see angels, right, whether they're glowing or not, whether they're muscular or just kind of, you know, just kind of cool and, you know, GQ style, whatever. However they showed up, they're hovering there before you, and they're speaking to you. You would immediately be afraid. Right. Can we just own it today? All right. So they're afraid and they're waiting. What is this message? And in the midst of them being afraid, in the midst of all that's going on, they speak peace. Now I want you to think about this. This has been a long time, right? Over 2,000 years. Has there yet to be peace throughout the earth? (laughs) No. So what we understand by that is the peace that he was speaking about wasn't the peace that you and I kind of understand. We want peace in every relationship. We want peace in every situation. We want peace in our careers. We want peace in our classroom. We want peace in our home. We want constant peace. And if we're not careful, if we assume, like they assumed, and we still assume, if we assume that when God speaks peace and he says, I want you to have peace... And I'm going to give you peace that if we're missing it, if we're thinking that he's going to bring peace to everything in our life, we're completely wrong. And we're going to miss who God is. What he's talking about is this peace that's going to come from in, from in here. It's this peace that in the midst of all that's going on, that's where I find peace. So if this, is, this peace is promised... And we understand that there's never going to be peace. There's never going to be an election in America, right, where it's 100%. Anybody? I, now, this isn't your time to be political, all right? I'm just saying we could even take a poll in the church today. We're not going to do that because I don't want to fight before church or after church or whatever, okay? I want you to come back because there's Republicans, there's Democrats, there's Independents. There, there's all kinds. Are we okay? Just take a deep breath, okay? We're okay, all right? Because we're never going to have peace. We're never going to agree on everything. And that's okay. Because there's a bigger picture. Peace is promised. And if he promised it, he will give it. So then how do we do it? How do we find it? How do we maintain peace? Well, 
I've got an updated snake story for you as we talk about fear, okay? So if you've been here long enough, somewhere in the 15 years of my first year here, um, Trinity, as a young little, you know, 18-month-old, whatever, little girl, she wanted her Cheetos. And so I went outside into the, the minivan at the time we had, barefoot, and I never, ever go barefoot. But I went barefoot because I was in a hurry. I'm going to go get Cheetos out of the minivan because my baby wanted her Cheetos, right? And that's what dads do. As I'm waking out, walking out, get the Cheetos, I must have stepped over the snake. As I'm coming back, I made it mad. It saw its opportunity. It bit me on the big toe. As the story goes, I'm coming into the house, but there's, there's, there's masculine screaming going on, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> And so I'm coming. Well, Amy's in the, the dining room. We are renting a house at the time on Mockingbird Lane. And I'm trying to get into the house because I have no idea what just got me. And I'm holding the Cheetos. And I'm trying to get in the house. But Amy's thinking that I'm being terrorized. Somebody is getting me. That's how manly the screams were. <laughs> so in the midst of me trying to get in the house, guess what my wife is doing? She's trying to get me out of the house along with this burglar or whoever, right? Okay. And so I'm trying to, no, no, something's happened. So finally, she lets me in and we determine that there's two holes in my second toe, whatever that's called, the second toe next to the big one, okay? And I realize, okay, something happened. I look back and there's a snake called up. I get my size 12 shoe. I smack it, I kill it, call a couple buddies of mine. They say, yeah, you need to go to the hospital. I go, long story short, I'm, I deal with it, right? And I'm preaching in sandals the next three weeks, okay? So I, I developed a, a genuine fear of snakes. Is that okay? Well, fast forward, just uh, two Wednesday nights ago, I'm, I'm walking from this building down to the next. This isn't to cast fear on you, just be aware, okay? So I'm just walking down, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to the building, and I see a snake. It's just kind of coming along, the little, little walkway there. And I was like, you know what? This is my opportunity. Something, tr you know, something switched, right? And I was like, there's a snake, and I'm not afraid. I did not let out a squeal. I didn't run right? I just said, okay, this is my opportunity. So I go and I step on its head. And immediately I feel this sense of, oh yeah, man card back in the pocket. Okay. I got it. Then immediately after that sense of pride, I then go, now what? Because I've yet to kill the snake. It's caught up around my shoe now, and it's just doing its thing. And I don't, if I let up, it's going to get me again. And, you know, it's the other foot, but it's still the same deal. And I, nobody's around, of course. And I see my buddy Eric, he's in the doorway, and he's checking his phone. And I'm like, how can I cry out? <laughs> <laughs> and keep the man card, right? And I said in a deep voice, Eric. Hey, Eric, you know, and then my voice cracks and that sort of thing. And he finally gets, understands what's going on. I say, we've got a snake here and, you know, deal with it. He gets his <laughs> knife because he's that kind of guy. And he cuts the head off and we deal with it. I, I say that, all that to say, we have fears, right? I mean, we, we have real fears that are things like that, that even in the midst of we think we've got it, and then all of a sudden in the midst of, I've got it, I've got control of this, and all of a sudden we think we've got it, and all of a sudden we go, oh, <laughs> there's more to this, right? And so though, beside the snake fear, beside the snake stuff, I think we have real fears that we face every day. I, th I think we even call them anxieties. And if we're not careful, they can overwhelm us. I just, this kind of kind of work through, just because I know you, I know me, I know our society, so I'm going to do my best to kind of cover some things as, as the Holy Spirit begins to show you maybe some things that you've been anxious about, maybe some things you've been worried about, and maybe we can kind of hit a nerve. So adults, we, we worry about our children. We worry about their grades. We worry about the right friends, the right team, assuming they're, they're playing sports. We want them to have the right teacher. Uh, we want them to be included in whatever they're doing. We want them to feel safe. Uh, we want to know how we're going to, if we're going to go to college, uh, how are we going to get them to college and what kind of degree and when are they going to decide and how are we going to pay for these loans and is that career going to pay for that and we worry about all those things. We worry, worry about their future spouse. How are they going to be treated? What, they're, what our grandkids are going to be like? Did I prepare them for life? Will they take care of me <laughs> when I'm old? That's a big one. Young people. 
You're worried about your image. You're worried about your status. You may not admit it to your parents. You may not admit it to any other adults, but you're worried about your status. You're worried about your grades. You're worried about the expectations placed on you because we have a tendency to place greater expectations because if we're not careful, we're trying to live out our dreams and our goals through you. You feel like that you're being judged. You feel like you're being compared to and not like we did when we were growing up, but you feel like it's there right in front of you, right in front of your phone, and you're constantly being compared to maybe someone else, and you're not living up. Singles, if you're here, you're worried about meeting the right person. You're worried about hearing, when are you going to get married? You're worried about, do I really want to get married? And you're trying to feel like, am I enough if I'm not married? Let me just say, yes, you are. And as we get older, we worry about our health. We worry about being cared for and the cost that it goes along with it. Uh, we worry about being left behind because our two-year-old grandchild knows more about that technology than we do. Being valued, being heard, you're worried about finances, you're worried why don't the grandkids call, and you're worried that when they visit, when are they going to leave? <laughs> Did we cover it? Are we there? Okay. I, 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 think, I think in life is filled with real stuff. Real stuff. We don't have to spiritualize it. We're facing real things. You are consumed with things to be worried about, to be stressed about. And you look at this box. We're going to get here just a second. Okay? And there's a reason why the worries one's bigger than the God one. At least those who are close enough to be able to see it. But, but before we get there, let me read from Philippians chapter 4, 6 through 9. Paul is in prison. I, I refer to Philippians a lot because I love the perspective. Paul is in, in, a, in, in prison, and yet he's writing to us and to the church in Philippi about peace. In the midst of the darkest time in his life, he's still writing about peace. And this is what he has to say about it. He says, don't worry about anything. Anybody catch that? Now, it, it, it's one thing for someone to be really wealthy and not really face any real life stuff. Like that, people go shopping for them, cooking for them. I mean, we're talking about, I don't, we don't know anybody like that. But, but if somebody were to say to me that's in that place in life, don't worry about anything. I'm going, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> but, but this is a guy who's in prison. He's chained to guards 24-7. And so when he says don't worry about anything, I'm going, okay. So what is he going to say here? Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and then thank him for all like, watch this, he has done. What he's not saying is thank him for what he's going to do because you better be okay. You need to thank him for what he's done for you because all that he's done for you, listen to this, is more than enough for you. If all Jesus ever did for you and I, or you and me, would, were to, was to die on the cross, he did more than enough. That's it. And then he goes further. He says, well, I'm going to leave you, Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, the person and the power of God is going to live within you. You put your faith in me. He's done more than enough for us. So thank him for all he has done. And then you will experience, watch this, God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. It doesn't make sense that in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of, of bad medical news, it doesn't make sense that God could breathe peace and to make sense of this, but trust it. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, and this is where I want you to fix your thoughts, watch this, on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing then, because it's conditional, the God of peace will be with you. If you're taking notes and you say, finally, he's, he's at it, okay? Our lives will always move toward our strongest thoughts. Think about it. I'm not trying to be new agey, all right? This is, we just read about it. If he's saying, fix your thoughts, then what that means is my life, my heart, my, my direction in life is going to move toward my strongest thoughts. Just as worry and toxic thoughts are harmful to us, prayerful thoughts are good for us and can transform us in positive ways. Paul would say that on autopilot, 
If you're just going through your day on autopilot and you just base how you see life and experience what you're going through on autopilot, you're going to have sinful thoughts. And what I mean by sinful thoughts, you're going to say, you know what? I I can't get through this. There's no way God's going to help me. This is too big for me. It's too big for God. Whether it's a a sin you're kind of battling or it's a relationship issue that you're just wanting to throw the towel in. If whatever it is, if, if you're just looking from the direction of I can't do this and God's not big enough, then you're going to move toward giving up rather than keep going. So how do we learn to fix our thoughts? How can we do it? I think for me, we begin to kind of read scripture, maybe memorize a couple of verses. I think we listen and are being part of, maybe we can't corporately worship like we do this morning, but we find songs that that encourage us. We engage in godly conversations. We put people around us intentionally who are going to fill us with joy instead of suck our joy out. We're going to put people around us that are going to encourage us, remind us, hold us accountable in a loving way. I'm going to challenge you this week, begin to think about, and even today, think about this past week. What have we done to help us fix our thoughts on Him? On things that are pure, on things that are admirable, on things that are holy. So what is worry? What is worry? When we think about if, if that's something that I'm not supposed to do, don't, don't worry about anything. What is that? Well, worry is this. Worry is the sin of not trusting the character of God. The sin of not trusting the character of God. So what are, those, what are some of the attributes in the, of, of God's character? I believe that first of all, God is love. All right, we, we've got to understand that God loves us. That everything he does, everything he allows, everything has to do and comes through this, this, this idea and this perspective of I love you. And it's not just I love you, the whole world. He picks out us individually because he can. He says, I love you. So everything's coming from that. He's also, we need to understand that one of the attributes of God's character is that he is all powerful. That he is bigger and he is badder than any boogeyman out there. That he is bigger and badder than any problem that you have. Whether you created it or someone else created it, he is bigger and more powerful than anything you can face. And then he also keeps his promises. He says that if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then we understand as throughout history, God has been good. Bad things have happened, but God has been good. You watch the Old Testament, you watch the Israelites, you watch the Jewish people, as God was leading them and loving them. When they were were disobedient for for years and years and years, there were consequences, just like for us. If we're disobedient, there's going to be consequences. God has to be just, right? But every single time, God came back and he said, Hey, here, come back to me, come back to me, come back to me. And in the end, when we were all just focused on ourselves, and the world seemed like there was no hope, then all of a sudden we see Jesus on the cross. The God of the universe says, I love you this much. And even though I am all powerful, I'm willing to lay down my life for you. (laughs) Because I'm keeping my promise. That I didn't just come to just be born and to live a life that was sinless and blameless and to become that atoning sacrifice, but I'm willing to die for you. And then he showed his great power and might by being raised from the dead so that he is alive and well. And then there's another promise, which is what Advent is not just about the baby Jesus, but it's about him dying on the cross. But it's also about we're waiting for him to return to us again. This life is not everything. (laughs) This is just a holding place for us. There's eternity awaiting us on the other side. Worry is saying... God, I don't trust you in this, whatever this is. It's also saying, God, I don't believe you're good or strong enough to cover this, whatever I'm going through, whatever I'm dealing with. Or it's saying, God, I don't feel significant enough for you to care about my problem. So, you're like, when is it going to get to the boxes? All right, here we are. We're at the boxes. So I want you to kind of just think about how you see worries. And then comparison, for those of you on the back row, the the expensive seats back there, okay? You have God. And, and here's what we do. We, we, we carry around this life, and we have all these worries. 
And, and we may not be intentional about it. It may not be something we planned on, but, but here's the way it looks most often if we're not careful. If we just set our lives and our hearts and following Jesus on autopilot, then all of a sudden this box of worries becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. We're facing something. We throw it in this, this worry box. We put it here. We say, well, I'm just going to worry about that. I'm going to think about it. It's going to keep me up at night. I'm just going to worry about it. I'm going to worry about it. And then here's what we do. We see God and we say, okay, well, I've got this God box. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a worry at a time. Whatever might be, I'm just going to okay, give it to God because I believe in God. I believe that He is big enough. I believe that He loves me. But if you're like me, here's what happens. Well, I'm, I'm worried about my finances, right? I'm worried about my finances a little bit. I'm worried about this relationship. Did I say that the wrong way? I mean, they, look, they sounded like they were, my, their feelings were hurt. And so how do I deal with this? Or they're just rebelling and I'm just worried about how do I fix this? How do I fix them? And so we take that worry and we have our time with God. He points it out and we say, okay, well, I'm going to put that in the God box because right now I see I need that but if you're like me here's what happens you put it in God box um, so God when are you going to do something about that I mean I just prayed about it 10 minutes ago and you have yet to fix them <laughs> you have yet to make that different you have yet to fill my bank account back up to cover all the stuff you know you've yet to fix that person and here's what we do we trust to God in that time of prayer but as the day goes on we can't we can't stop thinking about it instead of praying about it we're just thinking about it here's what we do we say God I've given it to you long enough and we take it out and we put it back in the worry box anybody want to own it today so here's the deal we 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 have a choice to make we're either going to keep that little box and we're going to call it God and we're going to say things like God is big and God is good and God is all powerful. God loves me and I trust him and I believe him for big things. But are we more consumed with the things that we're worried about? Are we trying to fix things? Are we trying to analyze things? Are we, are we having sleepless, restless nights? Are we truly giving it to him? See, what I, would, what I would think that we would need to do is I think we need to kind of spin it around a little bit. I think we need to put more stuff in the God box so that leaves less room for the worries. And we take these things one by one. We take these worries. We take, and they're real things. They're real things that we're anxious about, that we're fearful of, that we just can't figure out. And we put them. We put these little worries, and the more we put our worries and transfer them over to God, and we trust Him, and we give it to Him, and we say, God, you are good. I know that you are good. We begin to put things like, you know, I don't know how I'm going to overcome this addiction, but God, I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to trust you. When you say, hey, that's a trigger, I'm going to get myself away from that. When you say, God, you are having trouble, all right, you're having trouble forgiving that person who hurts you. Right? Then I'm going to say, God, help me. Help me every time that I think poorly of them and I think I want bad thoughts for them and I begin to be anxious about that. God, I want to trust you. You love them and you've called me to forgive them just like you forgave me. And God's going to give us those promises. The more we give to him, then all of a sudden those worries begin to shrink. And here's what eventually I hope begin to happen. We take God and we say, you know what? I'm not just going to hold on to a few things. I'm going to cover everything with you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust that you are good. I'm going to trust that you love me. That you're always looking out for my best. That you are bigger than any problem I can face. You're bigger than any anxiety. And as Christmas approaches, when I'm worried about what my kids want and what my grandkids want and what my spouse wants and what they deserve, and if I could... <laughs> I'm going to trust in you. And I'm going, to help. I'm going to pray that you give me guidance and you give me wisdom. That this year, if finances is an issue, then this year we're going to do what we can. We're going to try to do what we can't. Because that feeds my anxiety. It doesn't feed my trust in you. What a life lesson for not just us, but for our kids and our families. We begin to break that chain of that, that sinful thought process that the more I give them, the more they're going to love me. No, no, no. They just want you. They just want you. 
That's how the enemy deceives us. Trust him. Trust him. Here's something I think that will help us learn to transfer those worries over to God. What does it look like practically? Here's what it looks like. I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to do what I can do. So what can I do? We're going to keep it simple and very practical. I hope you can take this with you, right? You take it with you. And you're going to walk throughout this day, throughout this week, throughout this, this season. You're going to take and you're going to focus on what I can. What can I do? I can fix my thoughts. I can begin to fix my thoughts on God's character. What is God's character? What is it? You know, just simplifying it. He loves me. That's what I can do. I can fix my thoughts on the fact that he loves me. I can fix my thoughts on how powerful and, and amazing God is. I can fix my thoughts on the fact that he keeps his promises. That he will never leave me nor forsake me. Number two, not only can I do what I can do, but I can give God what I can't do. So what can't I do? I can't change my circumstances. I can't change the circumstances I'm in, whether it's my choosing or someone else's choosing. Someone, so you want to spread these rumors about me and you don't know how I feel about them? No, I don't. I don't, I don't understand that. But when you can't fix that. You can't fix your circumstances. You can't change the people that are, that are causing you trouble. You can't change that. You can't completely, you can unfollow them on Facebook or Instagram, but you can't get them out of their li your life forever. Somebody said, you yeah. You can't change that. But you can give God and say, God, I can't do anything with them. I can't do anything with this. I don't have control, but you do. So help me to be at peace in the middle of this. Number three, and then you trust God no matter what. You trust him. Say, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know you're in control. I know you've got this. Here's some questions I want you to kind of, kind of think through. They're not on the screen, but I'll just kind of throw them out there. A friend of mine, we were kind of talking about this, this week and talking about how you know, we kind of work through these things, and maybe this will be helpful for you because uh, whether it's weekly or monthly, depending on you know, when your anxiety strikes and when it kind of comes up, I want you to encourage you to kind of work through some of this. What has God said about his love for me? Not, not about just the world, but I'm talking about what, what has God said about his love for you? He said it all on the cross, all right? If someone's willing to die for me, I know how they feel about me. Am I where I'm supposed to be? All right? So is God truly in control of my life? Is God truly, am I in the wrong place? Are the anxieties and the worries and concerns I have, are they because I've made some poor choices, some unwise decisions? Then maybe it's time for me to go, okay, I need to own up to, to my part in this. And then, am I doing anything I need to repent of? It doesn't mean that all your anxieties and all your worries and all your concerns are your fault, but that's where you need to start. Because what the enemy would have us to do is focus on it, says, is deflect the ownership, right? And when somebody blames us for, someone, for something, when somebody calls us out, whether it's our spouse or someone we trust, or a coworker, or whatever, that, that's just really trying to help us to see a blind spot, our first response, this may not be you, but it's me. Somebody calls me out on something in love and somebody I trust and I'm going to listen to, then my first reaction is, that's not me, <laughs> Well, you don't know. No, no, no. So, so just take ownership. Step back. It's okay. Is this really me? Is this something I need to change? Let's start with me. And when we begin to start with me, we become peacemakers. We become part of God and what he's trying to do. So what does it really look like to actually hand it over to God? This, this concern. What does it mean to take you know, this box of God and cover it up, right? And just say, okay, these worries are gone. I'm not going to try to fix them. I'm not going to try to come back and God say, now, how are we doing on this, right? But I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to bring it up, but not in a nagging way. So I, I think about this. Um, you know, when Trinity was younger, if she had a toy, and I'm not a big fixer person, but, but I can handle a Barbie doll that, that has been decapitated, right? I mean, I could handle that back in the day. I don't know what they look like now, but I could squeeze that thing and get it back in there. And so there was a time where she'd bring that, that baby doll or Barbie doll to me and body in one hand, because it was never clothed, right? And then the head in the other and say, Dad, 
You know what, what dad could do is I could take it. But the cool thing about it, as time went on, you know what she did with that? She would bring it to me and she would give it to me and say, fix it. And here's what she didn't do. She didn't stand there and go, hey, how long is this going to take? You know what she did? She went back to her other toys. She went back and she played. She did her thing. And she knew that dad was fixing Barbie. She knew that dad was putting the head back on and not worried about the clothes and not worried about the leg or whatever the case may be maybe going on because she trusted that I was putting that thing back together. So she's busy with her life. And that's what it looks like. If I'm truly going to trust God with my stuff, then what that means is I've got to bring it, whether it's to an altar like this, or it's in your car ride home, or it's in the morning, or a daily basis, whatever your stuff is, are you saying, God, it's yours. It, it's my past sins. It's my past regrets. God, you've forgiven me. I trust that you forgive me for those. So help me not to be fearful about those anymore. Help me not to hold myself uh, guilty for those anymore. Or these relationships that, hey, I'm doing my part. I told them I'm sorry. Or I asked them, hey, is there anything we can do to, to resolve this? I've done my part, but I've got to let this go. And so I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. So here's the, the final slide for you. Is the more we pray, focused on sharing our burdens with God, the more peace we have about those burdens. And that seems so simple. I'm not trying to oversimplify your stuff and my stuff. But if we go back to Philippians, where he just simply advises, fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts on the character of of God. So if I'm not going to worry and commit that sin of not trusting the character of God, then the opposite of worry is for me to what? Trust the character of God and, and fix my thoughts on Him. So I'm going to give you a practical thing as we wrap this up. Someone gave me this advice, I'm just going to pass it on to you and I'm going to live it out too. That, so we're, we're going to call this the, the stop, pop, and choose, right? And there's not a fire, okay? We're not talking about that. But we're going to have a rubber band. I'm going to have a box of rubber bands for you. If you want to grab one to help with this, that's fine. And I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to stop you because you grab a rubber band, all right? And so, so what are you anxious about? Let's talk about it, all right? But, but what we're going to do is the, the advice we kind of got was you take this rubber band and you every time you think about that that you're anxious about, you think about that that you've been worried about, that you just stop and you just, just pop your wrist, not in a way that's going to harm you, okay? <laughs> We're not talking about self-inflicting abuse here, okay? We're just taking it, and I'm going to say, and that's going to remind me. I'm going to stop, I'm going to pop, and I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose not to hold on to this. I'm going to choose to let go of this. I'm going to choose to memorize a couple of pieces of scripture. I'm going to, I'm going to choose to just stop and focus on the character of God and trust Him. Maybe instead of choosing to think about uh, God and His Word and a song or whatever is focusing on you, maybe you transfer that thought of anxiety. Maybe you, be, you think of somebody in your life that needs Jesus somebody that's a new convert or somebody that doesn't know Jesus or somebody that's just having a hard time, that you pray for them and you focus on God help them because I trust that you're already helping me. Help me to pray for someone else. Take the focus off of me because that's where worry and anxiety start. It starts with, look at what I'm going through. Look how big this is. I'll never get over it. I'll never be the same again. And that's where it starts. But where we've got to leave it is we've got to step out and we've got to say, God, this is yours. This is yours. I trust you with it more than I trust myself with it. Would you bow your heads with me? God, I love you. I thank you for being a good God. And even when life is not, even when we are not good, you are good. So whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're anxious about, whatever we're worried about, help us just to pause right now and just think about those things and think about, are we trusting you? Not do we believe in you and are we saved, but are we trusting you? Or are we constantly consumed with this? Are we, are we constantly talking about it with everybody? 
Are we constantly, you know, gossiping about it or just, you know, complaining about it? Are we constantly bringing it up in a way that we're, we won't let it go? We won't let you have it because we want it. <laughs> as bad as that is, we, we, we grow to where we like that feeling. So God, show us those areas where we've been holding on to all these worries, all these anxieties. And help us to do what we can do. We can fix our thoughts. Help us to give to you what we can't do. And trust you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you give that opportunity to know him, to begin a relationship with him, because that's he, he is the true peace giver. The only way you're truly going to have peace in this life and in this world is for the Holy Spirit to reside within you. So if you're here today and you just want to say, Jesus, I love you and I need your forgiveness. I need you in my life. If you're here today and you want to pray that prayer and pray with you, just lift your hand. I'd love to pray with you. 